today we are delighted to be speaking with Dr. Matthew Emerson. Dr. Emerson is Associate Professor of Religion at Oklahoma Baptist University and the author of the text that we'll be discussing today, He Descended to the Dead, an Evangelical Theology of Holy Saturday. Dr. Emerson, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Dr. Emerson, to jump right in, uh, the traditional translations of the Apostles' Creed reads, he descended to hell, speaking, of course, of Christ. Is there any substantive difference between he descended to the dead and he descended into hell? Uh, it depends on uh, what you mean by hell. Uh, so it, in our modern terminology, hell means place of torment. And that is absolutely not what the original uh, line of the creed meant. It wasn't what people meant when they confessed that Jesus descended into hell in the early church. Uh, the, the issue, and I'm not sure how technical we want to get here, but I'll just nerd out a little bit for a second. So in the original Latin, uh, there is a, a set of synonymous terms, inferos and inferna, that are used interchangeably in the line in the creed. And so uh, inferos just means the place of the dead, whereas inferna also originally in early medieval Latin uh, meant place of the dead as well, but it came to be a more technical term used to describe the place of torment or refer to the place of torment. So we, that's where we get our word infernal from uh, or Dante's Inferno, right? But that was a later development in Latin. So in the early early uh, medieval Latin, Inferna and Inferos were synonymous. And this was just a reference to the general place of the dead, the place where all human souls go uh, upon death. Uh, it contained, it has, we can get into this later, but uh, there's just a general place of the dead. And that's what it was a reference to. Uh, when did there become confusion about whether Christ had descended to the place of hell, the place of torment? Yeah, actually, the early church and uh, even the medieval church, uh, are, they're very clear that Jesus doesn't descend into the place of torment. And even when, uh, say, Augustine kind of toys around with this idea, he's very clear that he was not actually tormented, even if he quote unquote, went there. It was just a, a proclamation of victory that would have happened. Uh, so the early church, the medieval church, they're very clear that Jesus did not experience the torments of hell uh, in his descent to the dead. Uh, the confusion arises really um, during the Reformation and afterward, especially in the modern period with this notion uh, that, uh, you know, Calvin in his institutes he doesn't really like the idea that this refers to something that's going on on Saturday. And so, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. If we want, if you want to follow up, we can. Uh, but Calvin says, no, this doesn't refer to anything that happened on Saturday. This actually refers to Jesus experiencing the torments of hell on the cross on Friday. And I, you know, I, I affirm penal substitutionary atonement. I'm happy to affirm what Calvin says there that Jesus experiences uh, the torments of hell on the cross. But I just don't think that's what the line in the creed means. Uh, and so with Calvin and then subsequently after that, those who follow him on this, especially in the Reformed traditions, uh, the creedal line changes from what the descent originally was intended to convey, which is that Jesus and his human soul proclaimed victory to those in the place of the dead, changed from a victorious notion to this notion of torment on Friday rather than Saturday with Calvin. Hmm. Was Calvin, John Calvin aware of the innovativeness of his interpretation of that line of the creed? Yeah, that's unclear. Uh, I think this is an area for further study. Uh, you know, there, there's been a, some recent work done on this. So uh, uh, Russ Leo, yeah, I think it's, it's either Leo Russ or Russ Leo, has an article that came out in 2018 on Calvin's dependence on Erasmus, actually, for some of this. And, and so it would be, you know, I think an area of research that's needed right now is to ask that question and to follow that rabbit trail. In the book, I was just trying to give a survey of historical uh, uh, beliefs about this line. And so I couldn't dig in to every century or even every major thinker. I just had to kind of summarize, but that definitely is a question worth answering. Thank you. Dr. Emerson, for some evangelicals, this line, he descended to the dead, seems to be in conflict with scripture. Uh, you cite Wayne Grudem's 1991 article, quote, he did not descend into hell, a plea for following scripture instead of the Apostles' Creed. That's the title of that 1991 article. Now, is the creed in conflict with scripture on this clause? No, I don't believe it is. Uh, Grudem 
Groom's argument is that the Bible doesn't support uh, this notion that Jesus experienced the torments of hell on Saturday. And I agree with him on that point. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, in Grudem's article, he doesn't go on to do the historical research to say, oh, this wasn't actually what the credo clause meant. It's, it's what some people today think it means, but that's not actually what it meant in the earlier medieval church, even, even in uh, some Reformation and post-Reformation context. It's not what it meant, uh, this credo clause. And so, again, in this original meaning of the credo clause, that Jesus experienced human death just like every human does, his human body is buried, his human soul goes to the place of the dead. Because he's the God-man, going to the place of the dead is also victorious. Uh, he proclaims victory there and then rises victoriously in his resurrection. That's what the descent meant. Um, that is affirmed in Scripture. Uh, and, and we can sort of dive into any of these more deeply if you want. Um, but, you know, the fact that Jesus died... And, and experienced a fully human death, including the fact that his human soul would have departed to the place of the dead. We can go to Matthew 12, 40 for that, where Jesus says he spends three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, which in Jonah is parallel to, is, is equated with the abyss or the place of the dead. We can go to Acts uh, chapter 2, where uh, Peter says that uh, God would not abandon Jesus to Hades, uh, which is, a, again, a reference to the place of the dead. It's not just burial. Uh, and we can go to Romans 10, where uh, Paul affirms that Jesus descends into the abyss, which again is a technical term referring to the place of the dead. So in these three ways, just affirming that um, Jesus experiences death as all humans do, and particularly uh, in, in experiencing death as his human soul departing to the place of the dead, uh, we can affirm that from Scripture. And, and we can especially affirm it from Jesus' own lips. In Luke, uh, in Luke 23, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And in, a first century, uh, in the first century context of Jesus, paradise would have been clearly a reference to the righteous compartment of the place of the dead. So I think, you know, in all, in all those ways, uh, Scripture affirms that Jesus dis descends to the place of the dead and, and experiences death as all humans do. There's, there's some other things to say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. We're really privileged today to be speaking with Dr. Matthew Emerson, author of He Descended to the Dead, An Evangelical Theology of Holy Saturday. Dr. Emerson, what else does this clause, He Descended to the Dead, mean? And what are some of the scriptures that help us understand that what's happening there theologically? Yeah, so a really helpful book in this regard. So, I mean, there's a chapter in my book on the biblical data, but if you want to go even further than that, there's a really helpful text by a guy named Justin Bass called The Battle for the Keys. And so he, he goes into even more exegetical detail than I, I have space for in my book, if you want to follow it up. And, and, and I rely on him for, for this point here, which is that in the early church, in addition to affirming that Jesus experiences death like all humans do, the descent clause also affirms three other things. Uh, so it affirms that Jesus is victorious over the place of the dead in his descent into it. It affirms that during his descent, Jesus proclaimed his victory to all those in the place of the dead. And the credo clause affirms finally that upon his resurrection and ascension, Jesus uh, released those in the righteous compartment that is paradise. And I'll, I'll come back to that release point. Uh, but just to kind of briefly summarize those three things and, and back it up with scripture for a minute. In terms of victory over the place of the dead, uh, the early church relied on, especially Revelation 118 in this regard, that Jesus now possesses the keys to death and Hades. And without getting into all the nitty-gritty exegetical details, the idea here is that this is a possessive genitive in Revelation 118, that Jesus has taken the keys from those who formerly held them, death and Hades, and now, and now holds them through going into their realm and coming back out, kicking the doors down, kicking the gates down, coming out with the keys. The early church also, in, in that uh, regard, would have seen texts like Matthew 16, the gates of hell will not prevail. As, as a reference to the gates of hell being the gates of the underworld. Uh, that, that was just kind of a common perception of, of what gates referred to. The, the doors of hell are locked and nobody can come out of them, but Jesus can and he does in his descent and resurrection. Uh, they also would have uh, 
gone to texts about Jesus talking about the binding of the strong man. And so where does, where is Satan's realm? Well, uh, in, in many second temple Jewish notions that Satan's realm was in the place of the dead. And so, uh, Jesus referring to going into the strong man's house and binding him, uh, would have been taken by the early Christians as a reference to the descent. So victory is this first element. Uh, secondly, the early church affirmed that during the descent, Jesus proclaimed his victory uh, to everybody in the place of the dead. And so before I kind of jump in on exactly how they would have affirmed that, it's important to, to come back to what is included in the place of the dead just very briefly. Uh, in the first century, in Jesus's context, many people would have affirmed the underworld as having two, maybe three compartments to it. So there's the general place of the dead. Uh, everybody who dies goes to the place of the dead. But it's nevertheless differentiated uh, between the righteous compartment, the unrighteous compartment, and then in many articulations of it, there's also a third and lowest tier, which is the prison for evil angels, Tartarus. And so paradise would have been this upper, uh, upper compartment for the righteous dead. Hades, Sheol, some, Gehenna would have been the second tier. Uh, of the unrighteous dead who are awaiting final judgment and torment. And then Tartarus would have been that third tier where the evil angels reside. And you can see, uh, you can see this in Jesus's parable in Luke 16 about Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, Lazarus and the rich man both die and both go to the place of the dead, but nevertheless, they are in differentiated compartments. Uh, Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, which is synonymous with paradise. He is, he is experiencing it's not the final beatific vision of God's presence, but he's, he's, he's a, in a blessed state. Uh, and the rich man, on the other hand, is experiencing sort of the, uh, the precursor to eternal judgment and, and in, in Hades or Gehenna. Uh, and, but even though they're separated, there's a great chasm that separates them. They can still communicate with one another. And so there's this idea that everybody is in the place of the dead, and therefore we can all talk to each other. But nevertheless, there's this differentiated compartment. And so in 1 Peter 3, uh, which is a very contested text, uh, and again, you know, any, anything we need to dive into more, we can. But 1 Peter 3, very contested text. Nevertheless, I think that this is a reference when it says, during which time he went and preached to the spirits in prison. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. I think it's a reference to the time between Jesus' death and resurrection. And he's preaching to the spirits in prison. Spirits in prison would have been a reference to that third tier, Tartarus. Jesus is proclaiming his victory over uh, everybody in the place of the dead. For the righteous, that's good news. For the unrighteous and the evil angels, that's a, that's a terrible proclamation. But it's nevertheless, nevertheless good news for the world that Jesus has defeated these enemies. Uh, we could also look at, in that regard, Philippians 2 uh, especially the very end of, of Paul's Christ hymn there, where he says that uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on the earth and then under the earth will bow at, at Jesus's name. And so there's this idea that in the descent, everybody knows in the place of the dead that Jesus is king. And that's, that's really what's going on in that affirmation. So he's victorious. He proclaims his victory, makes it known. Uh, and then the third aspect that the early church would have affirmed out of this credo clause is that in Jesus's descent, but especially in his resurrection and ascension, so this kind of three-tiered movement upward uh, from the underworld to the earth to heaven, that in that he is releasing the captives. So this would be a reference to Ephesians 4, 9. Uh, where Jesus descends to the lower parts of the earth. That's the phrase that Paul uses there. And, and by the way, Frank Thielman has done some great work on Ephesians 4 and uh, the Greco-Roman background for catabasis there, uh, which is the term he descended. Uh, it's very clearly a reference uh, to this underworld aspect of the cosmos. Uh, so he descends to the, to the lower regions of the earth, and then he ascends and releases the captives. So what does that mean? Well, uh, I don't believe the Bible affirms a kind of second chance after death. So I don't think this is Jesus sort of preaching the gospel to everybody and then taking out those who respond positively. Uh, 
I don't think this is an uh, implicit universalism where Jesus is destroying every, every aspect of hell, therefore it no longer exists, therefore everybody's saved. Rather, I think uh, that the captives here are those who, even though they had faith, until the Messiah came, they were captive to death. This is just true of humanity in general, right? Um, the great enemy is death. And prior to Christ's coming, we were all waiting. If you were alive prior to Christ's coming, and if, even if you died prior to Christ's coming, you were waiting for the Messiah to come and break the bonds of death, to, to defeat death through the resurrection. And in Jesus' descent and resurrection and then ascension, he actually does that. And so I think this release of the captives is referring to the fact that for the Old Testament saints, those who prior to Christ's coming had died, but who died in faith, that is, they were waiting for the Messiah to come and save them. What they were waiting for is now reality. The Messiah has actually come. He's there with them in the descent. He hasn't risen yet, but he's with them. Then in the resurrection, they see evidence that he really is the Messiah, even though he's already been there talking to him about it. They believe it, but he shows it to them bodily in the resurrection. And in his ascension, they're with him in his bodily ascended state. And so you have this idea of release. It's not as if they were being tormented in prison and now they're not being tormented. No, it's the fact that their faith has now become sight. That, that's really what I think Ephesians 4 uh, is after. So, you know, with affirming that Jesus really experienced human death and then with affirming victory, proclamation and release. That's the biblical basis for the creedal clause. And that's what it would have originally meant in the framers of the apostles creed and the Athanasian creed, which also includes the clause. Yep. Dr. Emerson, thank you so much for that survey. And what I find so fascinating about your work here is you survey the biblical data with the question, is this clause in the creed biblical? And throughout the process, you discover all of this other richness to the biblical data that most of us have never encountered or reflected on. So not only are you explaining the, this particular creed in uh, the particular clause in the creed, but you're explaining so much of our other biblical passages and making so much better sense of them. Thank you. Mm. Doc, Dr. Emerson, what does this clause, he descended to the dead, mean for our understanding of Trinitarian theology? Is the son separated from the father when he is in the place of the dead? No, he's not. Uh, this, you know, in the 20th century, the person who has done the most work in this area on the descent is Hans Urs von Balthasar. And he's a Roman Catholic theologian, very influenced by, uh, by Karl Barth, uh, but also by uh, Roman Catholic mysticism, especially a mystic named Adrian von Speyer. And uh, <clears throat> he actually takes this doctrine to mean that on Holy Saturday, the son experienced the abandonment uh, of hell and by experiencing this abandonment, that is separation from the father, uh, he takes it on himself, but through the uniting bond of the love of the Holy Spirit, father and son uh, take in to their inner life uh, this abandonment and therefore defeat it. Now that's a really roughshod survey. I mean, I'm not using quotes from him, go, you know, go read the original sources for that. But the idea is that, that the son is abandoned by the father, that he experienced, he experiences the visio mortis, this, this uh, vision of death. He, he experiences the torments of hell uh, by his own will. He does this and the spirit reunites father and son. Now, Balthazar in some places tries to be clear that this is experiential and not ontological. In other words, that the son merely experiences a feeling of separation uh, rather than ontologically being separated. But at other points, he's not clear at all on this, uh, this, this particular aspect of it. Uh, Moltmann actually goes further than that and says, no, this is a real divide. Um, in any case, this is the this is the notion of the descent that's popular these days, and and, and it's this idea that uh, the son is somehow abandoned on Saturday. When we experience abandonment, we can know that the son was abandoned by the father, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Even if it's not ontological, it's only experiential. Uh, and you know, I, I think that's problematic on a number of levels. First of all, I don't think it accounts for what you know the, the creedal clause meant. 
I don't think it accounts for the biblical support. I also think it has problems in terms of Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, I think that the idea that uh, the Father and Son could somehow, even experientially, be separated uh, is it gets you close to, if not directly into, partialism. Uh, so is the Father the only one who, who has wrath and is able to pour out wrath? Uh, is, is he doing something distinct from the son and his activity? So it's partialism both with respect to attributes and with respect to activity. And so I, I think that's highly problematic in re, with re, respect to the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and, and really the, you know, the technical terms that we would use here will be, it's violating inseparable operations um, and it's violating the, the, the simplicity of the Godhead, that somehow there are different parts that accord with the different persons. And again, you know, uh, if, if you go and read proponents of Baltazar's view, they, they would adamantly deny that Baltazar is, is somehow <clears throat> denying the classic doctrine of the Trinity. And, to be fair, that, that very well may be true. Baltazar may have wanted to maintain a classical view of the Trinity and this view of the descent. I just don't think it works out in practice. I don't think it's possible to do that uh, because I think it's violating inseparable operations and simplicity at the same time. Uh, so I, I think that in affirming the descent, we have to maintain the unity of the Godhead and also the unity of the, of the person of Jesus. We have to say the Father, Son, and Spirit are three persons, but they're one God, that they act as one, their attributes are one, uh, while also maintaining the unity of, of the, the person of Jesus, that he is still in the descent, the hypostatically united God-man. His divine nature is, remains hypostatically united to the human nature of Jesus, uh, and they're not separated. And th that gets funky in Baltazar as well. Uh, so there's, there's some Christological issues as well in, in this view of the descent. And so I, I think there are a number of reasons why the classical view holds up in terms of Trinitarianism and Christology, and more modern views don't necessarily hold up in that regard. Dr. Emerson, thank you very much for that reflection. Dr. Emerson, you state that this clause from the creed, he descended to the dead, is a source of comfort for you. How does understanding that clause more deeply comfort you in your spiritual life? Yeah, so to go back to one of the aspects of the creed, the creedal clause, uh, this, this clause affirms that Jesus is king, not just in heaven and not just on earth, but he's king over the realm of death. He's king over the realm of the last enemy. Uh, he's in charge. He has the keys. And so for all of us who face death, our own or somebody else's, uh, this is a, an eminently pastoral doctrine. It, it, we're able to say because of this doctrine that Jesus not only died, he didn't just die and then a moment later rise again. Jesus actually experienced what it means to be dead. He remained dead for three days. And so he knows what it's like to be a resident in what we might call the intermediate state. And so for those of us who are facing death, whether it's our own or somebody else's, we can say with confidence that Jesus has walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And he's with us as we go into that same valley. And it no longer is dark, but it is full of light because Jesus has gone before us. And he's with us. Uh, those of us who uh, have faith in Christ, when we die, we're with him, even, even though not bodily, we're still with him in, in his bodily presence. Uh, and that's, that's comforting news that Jesus has gone before us and is with us as we die. I think it's also comforting to know and, and maintain that Jesus is king. He's in charge. Death doesn't have the last word. Jesus' resurrection and ascension proved that, but, but he started to proclaim that in his descent. And so it's just this, uh, again, this affirmation of kingship. Uh, and, and so I think those are, those are comforting ways that this doctrine really speaks to us.
Dr. Emerson, we are really grateful for your willingness to join us for this conversation. And I'm personally really grateful for the way that you've untangled a very difficult problem for us evangelicals as we appropriate the tradition of the Apostles' Creed in our own theology. Um, if I can close with a question that I've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church today to be united? How would we, nope, it's okay. How would we recognize this unity, and what is it that we can do to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Sure. So, you know, unity is in part uh, founded on, and, and really, honestly, uh, the, the principle of Catholicity is adherence to the Word of God. So Catholicity can take, take on a number of different avenues. It can, it can be... Uh, it can be found through a number of different means, but ultimately Catholicity, that is the visible unity of the church is grounded in our adherence to the word of God. And so when we're talking about unity, especially doctrinal unity, which is what we're talking about here, we need to be, we need to be saying this is affirmed in scripture. Uh, this is a line that's affirmed in scripture. And, and that, that's really the first place that we need to go if we're going to be talking about unity in the church with, with respect to doctrine. Uh, at the end of the book, I offer a number of different uh, ideas for pursuing uh, this kind of visible unity with respect to this doctrine. One of them would be f for people in my own tr tradition, which is basically uh, I'm, I'm Southern Baptist and I'm conservative evangelical. Uh, and so both of those camps, which are often interrelated, Southern Baptist and conservative evangelicals don't like to say this line. Not only do they not like to say this line, they don't like to say the creed. Uh, and so just sort of a starting point would be for more conservative evangelical Christians to be willing to say, uh, we're going to affirm the apostles creed as a faithful summary of scriptures, doctrinal teaching. Uh, in doing so, uh, uh, sort of one B would be keeping the descent line in the, in the creed as you recite it. Uh, because even if some evangelical churches do recite the creed, they often take out, this line about he descended to hell. I think there are a number of other things that I would suggest. Uh, you know, I think tying our baptismal practices to the uh, doctrine of the descent as the early church did. I think, uh, you know, thinking through this issue of Calvin's view and how many reformed churches treat this doctrine. Uh, that's another way that we can think about uh, uh, unity in this regard. What would it take for Reformed traditions to more explicitly affirm the early church's view? It's not out of bounds for them, but what would it, what would it take to instantiate that in their in their practice and in their doctrinal statements? Uh, and you know, for I mean, just to be frank, I'm I'm obviously a Protestant. Uh, you know, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. Uh, have a rich tradition of affirming this doctrine, but there are a number of things about their affirmations of it that I think are extra biblical. And so being willing to come back and say, okay, these aspects of our affirmation of this doctrine are not actually in scripture, but we still want to retain this core uh, that I've talked about. I think all those are different avenues uh, of pursuing unity with respect to the descent. We are really grateful today to have spoken with Dr. Matthew Emerson, Associate Professor of Religion at Oklahoma Baptist University and author of the text we've been discussing today, He Descended to the Dead, an Evangelical Theology of Holy Saturday. Dr. Emerson, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.